Welcome back, y'all, to another episode of the What in the Sam Hill podcast, where I investigate paranormal phenomena, high strangeness, cryptozoology, ancient mythology, and the delightfully odd. I am your host and resident nerd, Aaron. Before we get into the meat and potatoes, I want to remind you that source links for my research will be in the show notes, so check that out if you want more information. Also, I just want to take a quick moment to thank everyone who is listening. This is my 20th episode, which is a huge hurdle. When I first started podcasting, I had heard that 90% of podcasts don't make it past episode 3, and of those that do, another 90% don't make it past episode 20. Since I started this podcast, I tweaked my format, changed my recording time, and finally started to figure out technology despite being an octogenarian in a millennial's body. It's been a journey, but it's been really fun getting to share my research with you each week as I try to figure out what in the Sam Hill is going on in this crazy universe. In honor of 20 episodes, I now have stickers for sale. Go to beacons.ai slash whatsamhill to get yours, link obviously in the description. And I am also now putting the podcast on YouTube, so I pref- if you prefer to catch podcasts on YouTube, feel free to look there. It's still just an audio-only podcast for now until I can get off my circa 2005 internet speeds, but it's another option for you if you're interested. With all that said, let the learning commence. This week, we are talking about Alaska's Bermuda Triangle, or the Alaska Triangle. It's a zone stretching between Juneau, Anchorage, and Utkiavak, formerly known as Barrow and definitely being pronounced wrong by me. In this region, suspicious disappearances occur regularly. It started as a topic of legend in 1972, when a flight with U.S. Representative and House Majority Leader Hale Boggs, U.S. Representative from Alaska Nick Begich, aide Russell Brown, and Bush pilot Don Johns disappeared seemingly into thin air between Juneau and Anchorage. Before and since then, There have been a bevy of disappearances, with a missing person's rate of more than double the national average. Like the Bermuda Triangle, imaginations have run wild, and possible explanations are endless. From the mundane to the mystical, everybody and their brother has a theory. Thankfully, my family has successfully visited Alaska multiple times without falling victim, but it's important to remember that Alaska isn't New York City, or even the suburbs. It's the wilderness. According to landmass, Alaska is a whopping one-fifth of the size of the lower 48 states combined, but its population is just one five-hundredth of that. Alaska is 2,500 miles wide, reaching from Savannah, Georgia to Santa Barbara. In the winter, some parts of Alaska never see sunlight, and others just a couple hours. In the summer, you have the opposite leading to one of Alaska's nicknames, Land of the Midnight Sun. There are coyotes, wolves, polar bears, black bears, and several subspecies of brown bear, including grizzlies and Kodiak bears. Alaska is home to 30% of all bear attacks in the United States, despite having such a small population. Many towns, including Utkiavik and Juneau, have no roads in and out of town and must be accessed by bush plane or boat. There are 30-ish ethnic groups of Native Alaskans stretched across the vast expanse. The climate varies from being similar to Scotland in the southeastern panhandle to essentially the North Pole. The aurora borealis is visible for most of the year. Much of the land in the interior has permafrost, meaning it never thaws. Some of the glaciers are so large that they create their own weather patterns. Now I'm not saying there isn't anything weird going on in the Alaska Triangle. What I am saying is that there are infinite ways in Alaska for you to disappear that do not involve the paranormal or supernatural. And that's assuming you even want to be found. I've mentioned before that my grandfather told me that many people go to Alaska running from something. So of these large number of disappearances, we have to consider that some of those don't want to be found, and that many have just fallen victim to the myriad ways one can die in the wilds of the last frontier. The most well-known example of the Alaska Triangle is obviously the 1972 boggs begich crash. With two prominent politicians going missing right before their elections, it's understandable that it would be national news, and that more resources would go into that recovery operation than any other. Before I get into the crash, I want to highlight a podcast called Missing in Alaska 
It was a 12-episode true crime deep dive on the crash by investigative journalist John Walsack, who has investigated this one specific incident for a decade. John has interviewed witnesses, put in FOIA requests to various government entities, tracked down information in local archives, and even been to areas on the flight path to get a feel for the land. If you want more information about the crash and its backstory, I definitely recommend you check out that podcast. Link will, of course, be in the description. But let's get into this crash, because I want to discuss parts of John's research, as well as the things that I found that seemed odd. One of the first things that struck me as fishy was with the widows of Nick Begich and Hale Boggs. Peggy Begich and Lindy Boggs were being pushed to run for their husband's seats before the search had even been called off. The plane goes missing on October 16th. November 7th was election day, and both Nick Begich and Hale Boggs were re-elected, despite it being national news that the men were missing and possibly or probably deceased. On November 9th, the papers were already publishing reports that both Peggy Begich and Lindy Boggs were being pushed to run for their husband's seats in the special elections that would occur once the men were declared legally deceased by the courts. This was done despite there not being a precedent for a woman representative from either state. This feels so weird to me, so disrespectful and so improper, but I think this is just politics. Both Begich and Boggs were Democrats, and at the time, Alaska in particular was a swing state, though obviously not a populous one, as they still only have one congressman in the House of Representatives. Both Peggy Begich and Lindy Boggs ended up running for the special election. Peggy Begich didn't make it past the primary, as the Democratic Party instead chose Emil Nadi as their candidate, who ended up losing to Republican Don Young. Ironically, Young had lost to Begich in the general election in 1972, but managed to hang on to a seat until his death in March of this year. Now, Nick Begich III, grandson of Nick Begich, the one we are discussing, is looking to run for his grandfather's seat in the special election to replace Don Young later this year. The timing is a coincidence not lost on me. Lindy Boggs, on the other hand, did win the special election, becoming the first female representative from Louisiana. Again, I think it's so strange that for a woman to be asked to take her husband's job before they even knew for sure he was dead. But I imagine the soul-sucking politicos in Washington didn't care and just wanted to garner the sympathy vote to help the party maintain control. Another extremely odd fact is that 17 months after the plane crash in March 1974, Peggy Begich married a low-level mobster from an Arizona crime syndicate named Jerry Paisley, then divorced him two years later with the divorce being finalized in November 1976. When they married, Peggy Begich was a widow with six kids. I myself had a great-grandmother who felt the economic pressure to remarry after losing her husband in order to help provide for her four children. But that was the 1930s. 1974 was a very different era. Women were allowed in business, and Peggy Begich was a rich woman following her husband's insurance payouts. She was actually purchasing the businesses that Paisley operated and the flashy cars and clothes that Paisley had. Peggy was also slightly older than Jerry. At the time of the wedding, she was about to turn 36, and he was 33. Effectively, Peggy was Jerry's sugar mama. Even if she wasn't aware of any of his mob connections, why is Peggy Begich marrying her sugar baby a year and a half after the famous father of her six children went missing presumed dead? I understand she wasn't exactly a Kennedy, but surely there would have been some level of PR team assigned to her and someone in the Alaska political circuit who could shake her out of this terrible idea, right? But that's just the tip of the iceberg. John Walsack uncovered an even bigger mystery in his research. In 1994, while sitting in prison for unrelated murders, Jerry Paisley decided it was time to start singing like a canary. There was a hit out on him by the Aryan Brotherhood, and he was hoping that by getting in with the feds, he would get out of state prison into the relative protection of the federal system, where he could serve out his time without always having to look over his shoulder. One of his allegations was that he was involved in a plot related to the crash involving Hale Boggs and Nick Begich. We have two accounts of his story, one from his interview with investigators, and one from an account he gave to a fellow prisoner. I'm going to use the combined account narrative that John thinks is the most accurate account based on his research and then add my commentary to that. Paisley alleges that Peggy came to Tucson before the crash and made a deal with Pete Licavoli, and that led 
to Paisley taking a bomb to Alaska that he and Danny Savanich put in the plane. In return for their parts in the bombing, Peggy made Paisley and Savanich partners in her bar. Paisley alleged that it was a hit ordered by Hoover, as in J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI. It's a wild accusation, but parts of it land. We know that Hale Boggs was in an open feud with J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. Though Hoover died a few months before the bombing, that doesn't preclude the organization from being involved, as Boggs was seeking to cut funding to the organization as a whole. We know that the FBI and the crime families were intertwined. Several FBI informants and undercover FBI agents were photographed at Peggy and Jerry's wedding. We know that the FBI never followed up with a full investigation on the allegations. And we know that Peggy did end up marrying Paisley. So she had at least some connection to the mob, whether knowingly or otherwise. But there's no smoking gun. An FBI hit doesn't explain why Peggy would have been involved as it was Boggs that had the beef with the FBI. It does seem that the Begiches were having marital issues and may have even been separated at the time of the crash. Perhaps Peggy thought murder was a better payout than a divorce? But that doesn't explain going to Arizona to find a hitman. John Walsack speculates that the Tucson mob was looking to expand to Alaska to get in on the new oil money, and that they were looking for a congressman they could control. According to his research, Nick Begich was clean so John suspects that they may have been looking to get Peggy into that seat to control her. I personally disagree with John here, although I do agree that the true cause of the plot would have to be related to the Begiches in some way for Peggy to have been involved. I just think that if you were going to go through the effort of assassinating two congressmen to gain control of a seat, you might at least get your candidate to the race. Peggy didn't even get the Democratic nomination to replace her husband. Also, if you had a controlled political operative, You wouldn't have them marrying a thug on your payroll. You want her looking completely clean of mob ties. Find her a nice dentist and a white picket fence or something. It just doesn't make sense. The perspective of Peggy's children, who are nearly all well-connected politicians in Alaska, is that Paisley took advantage of a grieving woman looking for love, that he was a real piece of shit when they were together, and that he is continuing to target her with his slanderous lies. I'm not sure that's entirely true. When Paisley told his stories to a separate fellow prisoner, who published a blog of Paisley's accounts under pseudonyms for both him and Paisley, he actually never mentioned the plane crash, and was clear that he wanted to use pseudonyms in order to protect Peggy and her children from association with his crimes. And even when he told the plane crash story to the prisoner mentioned earlier, he wouldn't discuss how he met Peggy or really anything about her at all. The only time he mentioned Peggy was to the investigators, and he seemed to regret ever saying that. If he wanted to punish her, he had opportunities he didn't take. Ultimately, it's a he said, she said, and probably will that remain that way forever, as witnesses are mostly all dead and evidence is becoming lost forever. Paisley himself passed away in 2010. But let's get back to the crash itself. Could it have been a bomb? As far as we know, based on radio transmissions and witness accounts, the plane completely vanished just past Whittier. The only evidence we have that discounts that notion is a supposed distress call from the supposed pilot, which was heard by several ham radio operators. The plane was down, he had three casualties, and they were slipping off rocks into the water. Then the transmission gave out. The Air Force investigators and John both believe the transmission to be false, and I agree with their assessment. John actually tracked down and interviewed one of those ham radio operators who received the transmission, and he provided some really interesting information. First, he was adamant that the transmission came through on CB Channel 9. That's a citizen band emergency channel, not a frequency range typically used in aviation. I find it odd that in a panic, Don Johns would be changing his radio frequency to send a distress call. On the other hand, anyone with a CB radio would know about that channel. Also, he was sure that the distress call said they were 130 miles southwest of Juneau. He actually thought Alaska looked quite different and was surprised when he looked at the map. Clearly, whoever broadcast the transmission was equally unfamiliar with Alaska's geography, Anchorage is northwest of Juneau. 130 miles southwest of Juneau is far off course and in the open ocean. It just doesn't pass the sniff test. 
Because of the properties of cold water, bodies, planes, and other debris have a tendency to sink instead of float. Wherever the plane debris ended up, that will likely remain forever their icy grave. And with time running out on any other avenues of investigation, that icy grave is where the final answers to the mystery lie. But while the Boggs Begich crash is the most famous crash in the Alaska Triangle, it doesn't represent the true oddities of the region. For more evidence of the odd, we don't have to look far. We have another almost identical crash just one month later. The Boggs Begich crash happened on October 16th in a Cessna 310. The search went on for 39 days and ended on November 24th. But on November 22nd, two days before the Boggs Begich search ended, John and Melba Bratton of Sepulveda, California, went missing in their Aero Commander. Their search went on for 24 days, but also was ultimately called off from lack of leads. There is a size differential between the Cessna 310 and the Aero Commander, but both planes are light aircraft. Both pilots were instrument-rated flight instructors with over 10,000 hours of experience, Bratton with 12,000 and John's with 17,000. And the Brattons were flying almost the exact same flight path as the Boggs Begich flight. To make it even weirder, the poor weather conditions noted on the Bog Begich Flight's NTSB accident report were not noted on the Bratton Flight's NTSB accident report. Presumably, this means the weather conditions could not have accounted for the Bratton's missing aircraft. Melba Bratton was a member of her local women's auxiliary club, and sadly, the Brattons had just lost their only child in Vietnam two years before. But that's all I know about them. Unfortunately, they weren't congressmen. So there was limited information in the newspapers, and I was not able to find anyone else looking into the Bratton crash. Regardless, it's extremely odd to me that the same thing would happen in back-to-back months. In Missing in Alaska, John talked to someone who participated in search parties at that time, and he said of all the flights they had lost, only three or four had come back with no hint of a wreckage found ever. So if it's so incredibly rare for them to have not found any wreckage at all of the Boggs Begich flight, Why did the same thing happen just a month later, again with no wreckage recovered, and that time while a search party was already in the area? Perhaps how is the more interesting question than why. How did a plane disappear under the nose of a search party? The Alaska Triangle is not limited to aircraft, though. There is a large component of this that is solely human. Hikers, climbers, hunters, but also just people in rural areas. It's the same concept as the missing 411 phenomena documented by David Paulides. The difference here is that Alaska is so rural that the disappearances are not limited to national parks. But most of these disappearances can be explained by the factors I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. There are predators of both human and animal varieties, extreme weather conditions, and crippling remoteness that can all kill one way or another. So personally, although I feel for the people who have lost relatives, and I do think some of the cases I read are downright weird, as a whole, I don't think that there's anything preternatural causing all of these disappearances. There actually aren't even that many UFO sightings in Alaska. Alaska has the fifth lowest number of UFO sightings, but there's so few people that it skews the per capita sighting statistic. Ultimately, There's a reason that many cultures of old always had some boogeyman or wicked witch living in the woods, encouraging the children to stay close to home. Nature kills. And to those with the untrained eye, nature kills mysteriously. Before I close out this episode, I do want to mention something about the plane crashes. When I was looking at the Alaska Triangle on a map, I found something very interesting. Right at the center of the triangle is the HARP Research Facility. Now, if you run in conspiracy circles, I'm sure you've already heard about the HARP facility and its possible ties to weather modification. That's not why it's interesting to me. The HARP facility deals in electromagnetic signals, and it's an extremely high power system. If they manage to light up more than just the ionosphere, they could easily tinker with airplane gauges. In clear flight conditions, called visual flight rules, the pilot would rely on an airspeed indicator, an altimeter, and a compass. In lower visibility conditions, called instrument flight rules, the pilot would rely on additional instruments and gauges to make up for the lack of visibility. The FAA has a lot of regulations to help keep people quote-unquote safe, but many of these regulations are impractical in the realities of Alaska. In the words of Don Johns himself, 
The FAA operates under the philosophy that the only legal airplane is a parked airplane. And if the pilot hadn't have taken off, the accident wouldn't have happened. That last bit is eerily prophetic given the amount of people who have automatically blamed him for the Boggs baggage crash over the years. Pilots in Alaska cannot always wait for visual flight rules conditions, and sometimes bad conditions creep up while in flight. Pilots in Alaska depend on their instruments. If those instruments are giving false information due to interference, it wouldn't be hard to crash into a mountain real quick. Not only that, but Alaska has an additional complication. While compasses work well here where I am in Georgia, in Alaska, particularly in northern Alaska, compasses are less effective. You see, magnetic north isn't true north. Magnetic north is on the northern edge of Canada, meaning the further you get in Alaska, the less accurate your compass is. The HARP facility only dates back a couple of decades, though, and certainly could not have accounted for crashes back to the 70s and even earlier. So while it is interesting, it's not a complete explanation. Ultimately, whether it's in the air or on land, I think the disappearances of the Alaska Triangle speak to the mysterious and dangerous nature of the land itself, rather than some unusual force. Well, as long as you're not a congressman. Alaska is a stallion yet to be tamed, and while it can be dangerous, it's a beauty worth beholding. That's going to wrap it up for this week's episode. If you have any experience or thoughts you want to share, please reach out via Substack, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, email, or even snail mail. I'd love to continue the conversation. And again, I want to highlight the Missing in Alaska podcast and the work of John Walsack. If you have any interest in the Boggs Beggage mystery, I highly recommend checking that out. Until next time, in the immortal words of Euripides, question everything, learn something, answer nothing. And I'll see you next week with an episode on the Chupacabra.